Listen in this interview when Brian talks about what his roommate was bringing home and buying in bulk from Sam's Club and stocking in their apartment. Also listen to some key advice they got from mentors, as well as what Brian did to finally talk to the right person at Walgreens. That and much more coming now. Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with Brian Wilkin. He's co-founder of Dude Products. Just to tell you a little bit about Dude Products before we get into it, Dude Products' first major achievement was when they won the 2013 INDA Non-Wovens Innovation Award, which is given to the most innovative product of the year in the non-wovens industry. And a couple months later, they were actually one of six companies selected from a pool of hundreds to participate in a consumer packaged goods accelerator called Incubation Station. They've been featured in a Times article, CNBC article, and even ESPN radio. Brian, thanks for being here. Jeremy, thanks for having me, man. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about Dude Products. And we get a lot of comments from people. They have tons of ideas. They don't know where to start. Or they have a current product or service, they're trying to get traction with sales, or they're not growing as fast as they want. Or sometimes they don't even want to start because of the fear of failure and embarrassment with family and friends. And you know, the topic you're going to talk about is how going from that idea to making that first sale in dollar and beyond. And how you and your team started a product in a new category, the moist toilet tissue for men. And before we get started with some of the kind of ins and outs of dude products, um, I always like to include a fun fact, and a fun fact about Brian is he's definitely afraid of heights. And there, I mean, you you were talking about how even one time you went out on like a, a patio area to make it seem like you weren't afraid, and you just got sick to your stomach and you couldn't yeah, take you it. Go, go, had to go immediately back into the. Conference. I think people can relate to that. Yeah. Um, so. First off, with Dude Wipes, how, tell us about how you came up with the idea and you knew it was worth it to pursue. Sure. Um, so after college, uh, me and a few of my buddies, you know, I graduated college and we, uh, we were living with our parents for a little bit and then we decided to move up to Chicago and um, it was like a five man apartment. So it was kind of wild. We were getting, you know, finally starting to make some money, all had jobs and we're living, living downtown and stuff. And uh, so one of, one of my co-founders actually, Sean, he was... Uh, he was in charge of kind of making the Sam's Club's runs, getting like the bulk necessities for the apartment, you know, like the the ranch dressing, the Miller lights, and uh, one of his favorites was baby wipes, surprisingly enough. And uh, so we all thought it was pretty weird at first, you know. Like, I, or, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Why is this dude stacking our bathrooms <laughs> with baby wipes, you know? And um, but after a while, like. Literally every guy in the apartment started using them. So and when you when you questioned him on this, what did he say? Like that's obviously a weird thing. Like you don't have any babies in the apartment. What was his explanation? Well, I mean, his he's a very blunt guy and very comfortable, you know, talking about this stuff. And so um, he basically just said, you know, man, I started using them, started using baby wipes as you know, complimented toilet paper in college, and got addicted, and I haven't gone back since. And uh, that's literally what happened to like all all four of all four of us that were living in the apartment too. I mean, like we all had you know office jobs and stuff, and you know sometimes you got to take care of business at the office, and like it's kind of like a we were kind of distraught when it would happen, and like you don't have the baby wife with you anymore, you know. It's it it just become it like became this addicting routine for all of us, and. Uh, so, you know, we actually, like, thought there might be something to this. Well, you know? what like, was it? What was it about it? Because I wouldn't even think to even try that in the first place, and obviously did. So when you try it, like, what was it that is addicting to it? I mean, you just feel so, like, just so much more fresh than... Really? I mean, if you just t- take a step back and think about it, like, if, like, a bird were to take a poo on your arm or something like that, would you just kind of wipe it off with, like, a piece of... A piece of- <laughs> Right. Yeah, it does make sense. You probably want to like wet it down, use some soap or something, you know? Yes, that's true. I, I like to use that like stupid little metaphor sometimes <laughs> to kind of put it into perspective. 
Um, but it, yeah, honestly, you just feel a lot more fresh like throughout the day and stuff like that too. So, um, yeah, so we uh, basically just were like, you know, why isn't there a solution out there for guys? Like, you know, there's women have wipes, like obviously babies do. And there's like no product out there that makes it okay for a dude to like use wipes. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, we just started kind of working on um, how we wanted to brand it. I mean, we actually didn't even know what we wanted to call this product at first. Um, we, we were going to think about going like a discreet route and calling it something like, you know, swipes or something like that. And we're like, you know what? This is like meant for dudes. Like, let's just call it what it is and be blunt about it. And mm -hmm. that's what we want our brand to be about is right. just being straightforward, approachable. And like, this is who we're, this is kind of who we're for, you know? Yeah. So, and, uh, so yeah, we just started, you know, designing the product. Um, and then obviously after we kind of like had a vision of how we wanted it to look and stuff like that. Uh, we did some market research. Um, I guess it was kind of a dual tracking, doing the market research, kind of thinking if this was a viable market. We saw that um, male grooming is like a booming market right now. And What did you find in the research? Because you have a strong like finance background in doing yep. this type of research. What did you find that was interesting that made it good enough that you go, yes, let's move forward with this? Yeah, so um, we did kind of uh, a few different things. Like, so we are obviously kind of going into this wipes market, which I, so the first things you want to look for is are these big markets a that you're trying to penetrate, and are they growing? What's their growth kind of prospects? So um, we looked at the wipes market and just as a general market, you know. So like even when you think of like Clorox wipes for your table that would be included in this kind of like general market mm -hmm. huge market like 12.8 billion dollars currently and projected to keep growing and then we also looked at the male grooming market international male grooming market which is it shocked me how big it was i mean it was like a 33 30, 35 billion dollar market like right what's now what's considered like a male grooming category i mean obviously this is a new category what's like what were you looking yeah, at the toilet tissue for men is especially in the us is um definitely like we've been actually quoted as kind of like pioneering this kind of movement um but other male grooming kind of products you can consider like you know, you see like the shave gels for men and gotcha. then like, you know, male deodorant would be like a male grooming. Okay. Um, but then even um, product, more niche products that have been growing are like, you know, male like cream, like face cream and stuff like that. I mean, just in the research that we did, it was um, just men in general, not even, you know, it's moving from more like what you would think of as metrosexual guys so just normal guys are kind of like becoming having more clean routines and just kind of you know present themselves in more comfortable ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was interesting. And then the third kind of piece of that is our direct market is moist toilet tissue. So when we talk moist toilet tissue, we're talking primarily baby wipes in the U.S. Um, so we did some research on what it looked like in Europe and um, anywhere from like Europe moist toilet tissue tissue like penetration was anywhere from between 10 to 40 percent of the market and so the u.s is only three percent right now so we kind of like took an average of like 12 percent over in europe and it's like if the u.s just kind of moves to the average in europe this market blows up to like a two billion dollar market in five years and it's a market that's not really you know penetrated at all in the u.s anymore so if we're kind of like a first mover in, in branding this, you know, where we can just ride that wave of growth. So you see, I mean, so you have this idea, you figure out this is worth it to pursue. What's the first thing you start doing to get traction with starting? Um, well, we, you know, we needed to first find a manufacturer that could make this product. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that, that was, that was kind of the first order of business. We, you know, after we designed, figured out it was, you know, a good, decent market to move into. We started contacting manufacturers mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it was, uh, it was a process to say the least, um, you know, dealing with manufacturers from all over the world. Um, how did you even begin to find a manufacturer in the first place? We just, I, you start, we started Googling wiped manufacturers and mm -hmm. 
most of, I mean, ideally we wanted to find somebody in the U.S., you know, but most of it, I mean, most of the companies were foreign. Um, and, you know, so we just started calling on them too. And we found, we found some U.S. ones too, but once one in particular, one story in particular was, uh, we thought we had a really good relationship um, with with one of these manufacturers that we had been talking to, and they were China based, but they had U.S. contacts, and um, so we had been having conversations with this guy. He'd sent us samples, and you know, it, it was pretty. It was a good wipe. We we actually liked the quality, and um, all of a sudden, this guy just kind of. I mean, it was like a few weeks worth of conversations, probably over that, probably about a month and a half's worth of conversations and we thought like we were kind of moving forward and then the guy just kind of fell off the map and hmm. we like didn't we just basically didn't hear from him and um you know it was a lot of these big a lot of these wipes manufacturers are big money manufacturers you know so like they deal with huge clients and so i think we think that was part of the reason why we just never heard back was because okay he realized that this was going to be kind of a bootstrap situation um, dealing with an entrepreneurial company like may not be working with huge volumes right away and you know he was a sales guy making a percentage off his sales so um, you know we just kept calling we just kept at it and uh, we ended up finding a great great manufacturer their US based manufacturer um, and our contacts there is awesome we've been working with them for the past uh, two years and um, yeah it's so it's definitely a process and you know there's some ups and downs through it um but you just got to persevere through that stuff what was one major thing that you knew like you found this this manufacturer is it was there there some things that stuck out to you that you knew this would work out yeah i I think it started with um just the personal relationship that we had with um the contact that we had our initial contact with Mm -hmm. he's our he's still our same contact um, you know, we've actually met up with him like a few times over the past, you know, a couple years, like three, four times we've gotten together with him. Um, so we really just, even looking back to that one relationship that we thought was going well, comparing it to what we have now, like, you know, once we found this guy, just, it was like night and day, you know, I mean, this guy had been responsive to us, um, no matter what. And he was very engaged with the brand we were trying to create too. The other guy wasn't so much and, you know, he just kind of was in it for the business. But Mm -hmm. um, our contact now with our manufacturer, like really, really gets what we're trying to do and loves it and is actually an ambassador for our company too. So yeah, it ended up, I mean, it ended up working out well. That's interesting. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought of that, but I guess it would be important that they kind of are on board with your mission. So they become, I mean, they're, that's a huge thing. You're man, this is your product, so you need and this they're, person. They're a stakeholder in your business too. You know, yeah. if they're willing to go out there and promote it, you know, good things could happen for their company as well. You know, so mm-hmm. um, it's always cool to find those big guys that like to actually still explore like the entrepreneurial spirit. Like I think that's um, something that is like very valuable if you can find that as you're searching. Um, for whatever kind of partners you're looking for, if they like really get what you're doing in particular, but like really enjoy the entrepreneurial spirit too, it's huge. Right. So now you have the manufacturing, you have the product. So what's it like early on trying to get your first customers? <laughs> uh, it was pretty funny, man. I mean, if you think about the nature of what we're doing, we're kind of selling and promoting a male ass wipe. I mean, you can use it for you know, whatever purpose you kind of want. Dudes are smart smart enough to do it, but um, it was just straight bootstrapping. I mean, we were, we had these things in the back of our cars, just bringing them to like soccer games that we play in. Um, We were bringing them to, you know, family parties, like introducing it to our family, (laughs) seeing if anybody wanted to buy them. Um, I mean, the first kind of like big exposure that like all of our friends and family had was, uh, there was a, so we, 
our, all of our co-founders are kind of friends. Grown, we've been friends for years since like about fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And um, so we've been going to a buddy's lake house for 4th of July for years. I mean, as long as we can all remember. Um, so <laughs> the first like kind of big introduction to a huge group of people was at this 4th of July party because we had gotten product about a couple weeks before the 4th of July last year. And uh, so it was, we basically, <laughs> one of my buddy's dads kind of introduced it and he was like, so the dudes have uh, made their first product and, you know, we had like a table set up with like all these boxes, you know, stacked up and we were basically just trying to push sales onto our friends and family. Um, so honestly, I mean, we, we just kept doing that for a while. I mean, we were, we were just grassroots and, and, um, you know, really that phase two was just testing the viability of our product. Like, would people pay for these things? Mm -hmm. And what we found was, yeah, I mean, people were more than willing to like pay for this like cleanliness solution. I mean, they think like the thing with the brand is like, it's engaging, like just with the name dude, you know, it kind of like tears down barriers mm -hmm. and, um, big informal, like, yeah. Yeah, and that's what we want to be. We want to be kind of informal with our customers and like engaging. But yeah, I mean, it's it's a challenge though. I mean, crossing that sales barrier. You know, I mean, we were. This is this is not like selling for cash. Selling boxes of dude wipes for cash is not the way that uh, you build like a profitable, scalable business. So, that's how you start, though, right? right. So, what exactly. are some of the responses you get from you know you walk up to one of your friends or someone? Uh, or even someone you don't know. What what are some of the responses you get? Yeah, so uh, as you can imagine, it it, it kind of <laughs> there's a wide range of responses that we've heard, and one maybe uh, one of my favorites is okay. So like when girls see the product and they come up and it's like, is this like for a guy's crotch? Is this like a sex wipe or something like that? And we're like, I mean. You could use it for that, you know, if you want to. But uh, we we primarily market it, you know, as a compliment to toilet paper. Guys kind of, we're trying to change the way guys kind of think about their bathroom routine, their bathroom hygiene routine. Um, kind of another funny aspect of this is, you know, I'm close with my family. And uh, my mom is a huge ambassador of pretty much anything that I embark on. But um, <laughs> this is a particularly strange thing for her to try and uh introduce to people and she's voiced that to me uh a lot is Brian you know I really love what you're doing and stuff but I just don't know how to bring it I don't know how to bring it up to people like I don't know how to introduce your company and um so yeah it, that's actually been kind of a challenge for for us too and we had, we really had to think about that a lot is like how what's your like five second or you know ten second spiel to somebody if if they're like you know what are you doing like if you say okay i'm starting my own company like well what are you doing you know what is it that that you do and um that was a challenge for us because you know if we just say a male ass wipe yeah, yeah so I mean, give me a comparison like early on before you figured out like you honed in on your five second what was it like before and then what is it now do you remember what you used to say oh man it it, it ranged uh, at the beginning, we were we were just kind of feeling things out and trying to gauge like people's reaction, kind of, you know. Um, so you kind of tested it by saying it, because I think this is an important question because people out there they may have a product too, and maybe you know it would really help to hone in on that that five second. What is it? Yeah, it, it really is important. I mean, and I think that's honestly the best way to go about it is just test different things, especially like. You know, our wipe could be an all-purpose wipe, and you know, we want it because we think it's more disruptive to be like a male like bathroom wipe. Um, it's more of a disruptive kind of like thought process. Um, that's how we wanted to introduce it to like people and customers. Um, but we also like didn't want to cut people off at the beginning or like you know make it make it a weird conversation right away. So we were kind of introducing it like. Oh, it's a wipe for dudes, you know, and just keeping it like real general. Mm -hmm. And people were just like, okay, you didn't tell me anything, you know. Um, but it, and then we would say, you know, we, we threw out like it's it's an ass wipe for guys, you know, and that actually like got really good feedback. You know, I mean, some people were turned off by it, but as we were more blunt about like what we were doing and what this actually was for, um, 
the conversation just gradually goes into like but you can use it for other purposes you know like guys can use it to like wipe off their face or their pits or whatever you know um so yeah really honing that message is is really important um and we've actually found the way to do it like even when people come up to us and ask like what is this we lead in with like our little backstory of like you know we were five guys living in an apartment one of us used baby wipes and they're we all got addicted and uh we just started developing a wipe for guys right it's like because the last thing you like, think yeah yeah it's, it's just a quick story that kind of like people can relate to a little bit more than just telling telling them what your product is for kind of telling them like a little bit of the backstory where it came from you know yeah so tell me um one of those moments that you just felt it was impossible to get that customer or sale one of those huge challenges what was one of those um so like i said we were uh we spent probably a month and a half um, just straight kind of, you know, taking around in our cars and, um, sorry, dog, dog is <laughs> He got excited about that question. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, we, like I said, we were like a month and a half. We were um, taking them around in our cars and selling them for cash, you know, to like friends and family and then just acquaintances and stuff like that. And then we kind of took a step back and we're like, you know, we kind of validated that like people will buy this stuff. Um, people are really engaged with the brand, which was most important for us. Like we wanted to create a brand that was engaging and authentic and people, people liked um, kind of talking about and stuff. So we took a step back and we're like, what's our next step, you know? And we decided to start like really reaching out to um, like online distributors um, that would kind of fit within like our demographic that we were going after, which is obviously kind of like the dude, like 18 to 35 year old guy is kind of the parameters we set, but it extends beyond that. Um, so we basically just started contacting sites, um, online distribution sites, online retail, and, uh, it was it was pretty it was pretty challenging, man. I mean, just the amount of calls that we made, or emails that we sent, or submission forms that we filled out. The amount of res I mean, the response rate that you get is, at the beginning is like two percent might be generous. You know, I mean, especially for this concept that we're introducing, I feel like that was a little bit of a challenge too. Because yeah, because when you no enter a new market, I mean. That's even tougher. You're like pioneering something that people haven't heard of. It's much easier if they knew what you're talking about. How did you, like what were some of the challenges you faced uh, when you were calling some of these companies? Yeah, so I mean the first challenge was just getting a hold of people, um, right? So that that was tough. And then kind of just getting them to understand what, what the benefits of this product, like carrying this product was, you know, because a lot of these retailers, they like to look at their competition and be like, okay, what, what are they selling? Are they selling anything like this? Um, and you know, for us, there really isn't anything, there wasn't anything out there really like, like a dude wipe, you know? So these, these people would like do their due diligence, look at their competitors and just not have an offering out there, you know? Um, so it was like disheartening, man. And you know, we just have to, we had to stay true to like, guys, this is going to happen. Like, you know, we just got to keep calling and like somebody will get it. And then once we get on one, it could be somewhat domino effect, right? Like once we get on one site and these things start gaining some traction online, um, things will start moving a little bit. And, uh, yeah, sure enough, that's what happened. Um, we, we closed kind of, um, the first sale after about probably a month and a half of like calling and things like that. Um, first online retailer. And it was cool. It was a, uh, a male like outdoor kind of site and they put us on Amazon as well. Uh -huh. And um, it was a score for us. You know, we felt really good and it, it was a small win, but like it felt like a huge win, you know? Um, so yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. What was one of the first sales that wasn't like a major distribution on a website. Do you remember one of those? Um, yeah, man. It was uh, one example that I like to kind of talk about is um, one of our 
so like I said, we all grew up together, all of our co-founders, and one of our really good friends is, is a Marine. And at the time when we initially got the product delivered, um, we sent out a free box to him, you know, and he was like, holy cow, like these things are awesome, man. Like everybody in my platoon is like taking them and uh, whatever, you know, he's like, I need to buy like bulk from you guys. So he bought like, you know, nine cases of dude wow. wipes and you know, there's nine boxes in a case. So he bought like 81, you know, boxes of dude wipes for, you know, his Marine buddies and stuff so like that. So what did that. they like about it? What did they say they like about it? What was the feedback? Because when I think of Marine, I think like the ultimate man's man. Like yeah. what, what were they enjoying about it? Like what did they use it for? Well, it is honestly probably the most practical product for Marines. I mean, they like, they use baby wipes, you know? So they were like super excited to see hmm. like, dude wipes you know like a a wipe that's actually made for like a man's man you know um and so it was pretty cool but like we knew that you know marines had gotten wipes and use them in the field because you know they don't have too many other options and stuff so we just thought it would be cool to you know send it out to our buddy we weren't really expecting much out of it um but man the feedback that we got was unbelievable from him and then another guy that i went to college with um was a Marine down in, he was stationed in Florida for a while, and I kind of talked to him about it, and yeah, they started buying from us too, so um, just a really cool market to be a part of too, man, just like actually helping out, like something that's a great cause, right. obviously, you know, it's a little bit more than just selling product at that point too, um, which is cool, um, but yeah, I mean, Whenever a Marine can validate your kind of brand and like the the badassness or whatever, right? Yeah, that's when we knew we were kind of validated. So, yeah. how did you break through to on the kind of when you scaled up when you got into the onto the website? How did you make that happen? Um, got onto which website? When you said one of the big first customers, when you kind of broke through uh -huh. and onto the onto the website, who listed you? Ended up listing you on Amazon. How oh, did right. you end up landing that? Oh, so that was, um, yeah, when I was talking about like just cold calling, I mean, that's, that was just kind of a success in cold calling. And mm. um, we had just, you know, we, uh, we just kind of kept, kept reaching out to him. We thought it was like a good alignment. And actually we knew backtracking now that I think about it, we actually knew, um, a friend of a friend like ran this site too so i mean just work in your network as much as possible mm -hmm. when you're trying to uh establish those initial sales is huge so yeah this uh this outdoor training site clever training he started he started his own company and kind of just stocks like outdoor kind of products on his on his site and stuff and was he liked our he liked what we had to offer you know and started started making purchases from from us and uh He's like, yeah, I'll open up an Amazon account for you guys too, you know, and um, yeah, and they started selling actually pretty well, um, mostly through Amazon, like, you know, some through Clever Training, but, you know, the product wasn't real well known or anything like that, and um, most people go on his site for like more outdoors kind of camping stuff and right. uh, outdoor training stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, that actually was uh, a relationship that we you know, like kind of a fourth degree relationship. So, is I mean, I guess the lesson to take out of that is don't be afraid to talk about what you're doing to anybody and everybody because mm -hmm. you never know what can drum up business. So like I said, we were cold calling, ran. Brian, so tell me a little bit about, I know like with all this, it's a big learning curve. I mean, there's a lot to that goes into this and there's a lot of steps and it's not easy. Did you get advice along the way to shorten some of the learning curve? Like what'd you do for that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, kind of building off the last point, it's just a lot of it is like, you know, not being afraid to talk about what you're doing, even though, I mean, it was hard to talk about like dude wipes sometimes, like just cause people have different reactions. I mean, you see a wide array of reactions, but, uh, so just talk to anybody. So I, I went to IIT, um, got my master's in finance, and one person that um, kind of linked me into a network that I just kind of 
had a random conversation with. I was trying to figure out like if I wanted to um, move on to a different job within finance as I was, you know, doing um, the dude products thing. Um, so I talked to uh, Luigi Pecoraro in the um, in the uh, career management center, and he <laughs> he thought. He thought what we were doing was funny, obviously, and um, he put us in contact with Nick Rokop, and Nick has been unbelievable um, as far as advice he's given us, and just like talking to other people about what we are doing, and um, you know, he works at eighteen, works with eighteen seventy one, so he's got a huge network of people um, that are in the entrepreneurial kind of atmosphere in Chicago, and um, so we, I always try and stay in touch with him, um, have, have a, uh, breakfast or, you know, a meeting with him whenever, uh, whenever possible. For instance, um, we just got back, um, a couple weeks ago, uh, my partners and I from Texas, we were in an accelerator program down there. And one of the first people I reached out to was, uh, was Nick because I just wanted to give him an update on where we were at and what we were kind of where we were at with our business and what we needed to do to kind of like get, get this thing going to the next level. And, um, you know, as always, he had, he had great advice. And, uh, so what kind of advice did he give you that, that you like really hit home for you? Yeah. You know, so, um, he is really good at, um, kind of bringing things into focus, you know, as, as we, uh, kind of go through like our, retail launch that we want that we want to um, utilize and kind of our big marketing push that we want to go for we our thoughts go all over the place sometimes you know and one the big the main takeaway or the big piece of advice that I took away from Nick's the conversation was with Nick was um, one thing entrepreneurs one of the first questions I ask any entrepreneur that comes and wants to talk to me is who's your who's your market like who are you gonna market towards and um, a lot of the answers are you know everybody within like the demographic we're going after or maybe just everybody and he immediately says well do you have like a 10 million to a hundred million dollar budget to uh, to make this happen and I mean it's safe to say most entrepreneurs do not have anywhere close to that kind of budget purely for marketing um, so he highly recommends just having a focus, like a laser light focus on owning a market, like owning one market and constantly hitting that market. And um, an example that he used was uh, the Red Bull example. And obviously Red Bull is a huge brand and company now, but what they had an extreme focus on and laser like focus was um, hitting the extreme sports world. That's where they did like basically all of their marketing was extreme sports. Extreme sports is pretty niche, you know. It's not like everybody identifies with that, um, but you know, it trickled down to mainstream society. I mean, you can't go into a bar or anything without them carrying Red Bull. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, it's just a really, really um, that that was like a huge takeaway for me because with our product, like people get so engaged with with the brand of the dude brand, you know. And there's so many different things we could do, but we have to be focused because we don't have that unlimited, you know, bottomless cash to uh, to rip through. So that was huge. I mean, and you need that. You need to be reined in by people too, because other people will just drag you in all sorts of different directions. But you need to like have somebody there to say, you guys need to focus. Like, know what you're going after, right. and uh, hit that hard. So, what made you choose IIT in the first place? Um, so I have, uh, my undergrad background was, you know, business and economics, finance and economics. And, uh, I had an interest in kind of deepening my technical knowledge of finance. And, um, you know, I looked at MBA programs in, in the Chicago land area and, um, did my research on that. And I came across IIT and their MS in finance program was, really what I was looking for. It was building off of kind of what I had learned in um, undergrad without like kind of overlapping a lot of the stuff. It was truly like things that I didn't know in finance at all. Um, so I wanted to get the technical aspect of finance exposure. Um, 
so that's ultimately why I chose IIT over like a Northwestern or, yeah. or or something like that. I mean, it seems like you got some also some great advice with Nick. What a, what was um, some advice piece of advice you took away from the was it the incubation station? Yeah, um, geez, I, there was a ton of takeaways from uh, from incubation station. So just as a means of background, these were some of our mentors there were people that had started consumer packaged goods companies and had since sold them and are dabbling in other um, CPG companies now. And then other mentors were, you know, market, market research people, marketing people. Um, key takeaways, I, there were so many. Uh, they helped us refine our business so much. And I guess the key takeaway from there is kind of the same thing as what Nick was, is like so much of our focus down there with what we're trying to do with our brand is like, we have to know what our brand message is and stuff like that. You know, like what is our brand identity? Um, have that strong. And then what is this product for? Like what are the uses of this product and make that explicit, like mm -hmm. on packaging and stuff like that. Um, so that those were some huge takeaways from them and just they gave us so much perspective on um, the aspect of concentrate on planning you get you can get so overwhelmed with like the here and now um, with so many things that are going on but, but um, you know you really need you really do need to take a look into the future and plan for um, the expected and unexpected really so that's a, that was a huge takeaway too, because you know these are people that had been there, done that before, and um, for us, you know, to just hear it from them, um, it's a great takeaway. Was there any advice that you remember that surprised you that you were like, hmm? Because I mean, your your brand is dude products, so like yeah. it's pretty like someone hearing that knows like it's a male product, like probably like you said, most people. Oh, it's for everyone. Like you've already kind of niched it down. So, what was some of the advice you got that maybe you took to heart that surprised you when you were there? Uh, let me think. Um, you know, I, I guess, I guess it was kind of surprising, and it was kind of validating too for us, because a lot of the a lot of people that um, we had talked to, and some people down there would always say you're cutting off half of them like half of the entire market by calling your product dude products right right yeah um which is you know a valid point but at the same time when we go back to this kind of focus aspect and really branding something for somebody or something you know um that was a huge takeaway is like a lot of these people actually got that and were like you know what that's actually really smart um which was kind of a step back because all we had heard kind of was um, don't cut off like half the market. You know, you're cutting off dollars off your valuation or the like, potential. And it's like, you know, we realize that, but we're not going to be as an intrigue. We're not going to be as intriguing of a brand or as true of a brand as we want to be by trying to reach everybody. Like we are our, this demographic and we want to reach this demographic with, with this product and with this brand. Um, so that was like something that was pretty cool to like kind of hear validated from these people that had been there, done that is like, yeah, 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 I mean, you guys can speak directly to your audience, which is awesome. So what was something that you did to try and make money that you thought would work, but it actually ended up just failing miserably? <laughs> um, I think the main thing, so, a few months into us having our initial um, order of product, we thought that a three-day fe like outdoor festival would be just an unbelievable place to like go and sell these dude wipes. And um, keeping in mind, we're working with like a very limited budget at the time. Um, we decided that we were going to buy a tent for all three days and like have like a vendor tent. You know, it's expensive. Yeah, expensive. Yeah, um, and so. <laughs> We did that with like the thoughts in the back of our mind that like no doubt will break even like that's not even like on the radar like we're gonna make a killing here, right? Like triple our money, and uh, that that really couldn't have been further from the truth. Um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of 
festival goers like like getting freebies and uh, sample free samples of things, especially when it kind of looks like this. It's just like oh, a small package, you know. They're just looking to grab it and leave the table. So um, yeah, that 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 uh, that grandeur sales um, thoughts that we had did not formalize, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was a good takeaway though in itself because. It, what we did notice was a lot of people were talking about like the product and stuff. And like when they would walk away from the table, a group of them were like showing it to themselves or, you know, and talking about it. And obviously in a, obviously in an atmosphere like that, it's word can spread fast and stuff. So we had a lot of people visiting the tent and stuff like that. And, you know, we made some sales, not nothing, hardly anything, but, uh, just the brand recognition aspect of it was a good takeaway because that's actually something that um, we're really talking about um, and discussing moving forward is like once we uh, raise significant capital being having a presence at a lot of these festivals. So what was something then that really worked that you were surprised about? Um, so we, uh, we acquired drugstore.com which is walgreens.com and so walgreens owns them and um you know so it's like a family brand type type store i guess is what you could call it um and so we ran a comment to win um promotion on facebook with uh through drugstore's facebook account and uh you know we were expecting pretty much little to no feedback because we just kind of figured that um, that wasn't a place where a bunch of guys were going to shop necessarily. It was drugstore.com. Um, but it turns out like we did this comment to win post and the feedback and interaction that was going on with this post was like pretty unbelievable. I mean, so like not even talking about like the sales aspect, you know, we saw a good sales bump after the comment to win, but like what is, what really is more important um, for us is we got to build this brand and to like know that people are talking about it. We had, I mean, there were comments from ranging from a grandma to like, you know, a person in our demographic, like a 23 year old guy to a teenage girl. I mean, it was, it was crazy. The wide range of people. I mean, I would say most of the posts were of like, moms that had kid like had kids or husbands and saying i need these for my dude you know like i mean moms were making comments about like their kids skid marks in their underwear and stuff like that and, I, mean, <laughs> I was gonna ask like what were some of the funny comments that you yeah i mean like literally moms were talking about their skid marks on drugstore's facebook page you know <laughs> their kids skid like, it was just it was really funny and like that was like what was most important to us and kind of eye-opening because when we when we were talking about a minute ago like cutting off like half the market well women have been really engaged with this brand i mean while guys are the direct beneficiary of kind of like having a cleaner hygiene routine girls are definitely an indirect beneficiary of it you know whether it be your mom or your right. girlfriend they're the only like, beneficiary <laughs> <laughs> like, guys don't, most guys don't care it's like the women suffer <laughs> yeah, right right so yeah that was uh that was a really cool kind of um surprise for us or you know i guess you could categorize it as a win so did they did you approach them and they just posted like how did it what did they actually post in that people commented on yeah so it was um we i can't remember the exact phrase but we had gotten in contact with um our buyer and said, you know, is there anything that we could do with you guys um, from kind of a dual marketing um, standpoint, you know? And uh, they have their own social media kind of um, branch within the company. And so he put us in contact with her, with uh, our contact in the social media marketing um, uh, branch or um, whatever. And so we had discussions with her and she, we kind of went through a bunch of options that they offer and we decided like this comment to win would be the best one so we kind of just made up like a little blurb um like what is why do you need dude wipes or something something to that effect i don't remember mm -hmm. the exact thing but uh, comment on it. 
Yeah, and then like they, there was a picture of you know the box up there, so they have like a good picture, and that's when the comments just started flowing in. You know, they posted. Was the picture on the front? Um, we show the ba- there's a picture on the back of the box, right? Oh yeah, yeah. So, you know, you could see this little graph graphic arts right here, like the man minus a dude wipe equals an ape. <laughs> so yeah, and like this. Um, this ape drawing was actually submitted by one of our customers. Um, so like, as I've kind of talked about throughout this, uh, this interview is like, we really want to be like an authentic and engaged brand with our customers. Like, Mm -hmm. and just from a general standpoint for like the viewers of this, it's like, that's so important. Obviously everybody knows that it's like customers are engaged in like every aspect of business in general now, like the more you can interact with a customer and it's so easy to do with like social media and stuff, the more like personality that you can bring to the table, I think is, I think is just hugely beneficial. So, I mean, you talked about drugstore.com and Walgreens. How do you even get into that caliber of uh, a company? Um, so with, uh, with that account, um, we I literally called their one eight hundred number, um, and I think it was actually like their customer service number. So it was just like first step in the door. I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to pose as one of their customers, I guess, you know. And um, you know, started with the little um, a little pitch about like what we were doing, and just asked. I mean, we were talking to an operator first, right? So it just asked like if I could get in contact with like the personal care. Um, a personal care section of the business and they were like of course asked why and you know I explained um, you know what we were bringing to the table for them and so she forwarded me on the operator forwarded me on and of, of course it was like the wrong department and I got a voicemail and um, I just I, I left a voicemail asking if they you know this person could potentially you know call me back and put me in contact with a personal, like men's personal care contact. And, um, you know, I didn't hear back, but I did have an actual contact name because I heard their, heard their, you know, voicemail. And so next time I called the operator, I was actually able to forward a name, give her that, give them a name to, um, to put me in contact with. So this went on for, I mean, probably three weeks. Like I would call, um, I left, you know, I left a message the first time and I would call like every third day or so. And I would call direct to that, you know, get put in direct contact with that number. And so I left like probably a couple emails on that person <laughs> or a couple of voicemails on that person's, um, mailbox. And then finally, um, probably two weeks in, like somebody answered on that, on that phone and they're uh, like leave, leave me alone no i'm just kidding <laughs> the guy was actually a really nice guy i mean it, you know people are busy so yeah you can't like that's another thing i would say is like when people don't get back to you when you're throwing an idea out that has really no in- like they have no interest they don't know you this. they don't know yeah. yeah don't like get offended because that's like the worst thing that you can do is like, oh, they're not interested. I'm not going to call anymore. Or like follow up. People really, really appreciate follow up. Like people are busy with their lives and like you can't, you kind of got to take a step back and be like, okay, dude products is like probably the last thing on these people's minds. You know, like I just got to show some, some hustle and like some will to like follow up. Um, so yeah, I actually had a conversation with this guy and he like laughed about what we were doing and he was like, okay, well, let me put you in contact with, um, the personal care people. And so, yeah, that's when, uh, that's when I was actually able to, um, probably about, this was probably about three and a half weeks to a month of just getting bounced around drugstores, voicemail, mailboxes and, um, finally I was able to talk to the people and they were really engaged and basically I just said, you know, you guys aren't. You guys are, you know, a uh, have a like a men's personal care section, but you don't have like a complimented toilet paper, or, like a hygiene, a bathroom hygiene wipe for guys. We are offering that now, you know, and uh, they were engaged right away, and um, literally that that sale kind of closed like really quickly. So what's 
talking about i mean that's like a high point then what's yeah. a, a lower point what's um one thing that you wish you would have avoided so far in the uh in what you were doing with the company yeah so um we so we like worked on like all this design stuff like with the box and like the wipe and stuff like that we did this all of all ourselves and none of us really have actually none of us do have like a graph graphic design background um so we really wanted to um refine our design and kind of make it look more professional and ready for the shelves um so we uh, decided to try and work with um, a graphic designer, and we, you know, those those people are expensive, and um, so we had a few meetings with uh, with this company, and uh, it was the meetings went great. I mean, we have branding decks explaining the kind of like brand we want to be, the kind of guys that we want to be engaged with, the kind of like customers that we want to go after, and then other ones of brands that are existing today that we really like and that we kind of want to like formulate our brand after a little bit. And sh like these people got it, like the conversations, they were asking all the right questions and really like loved the dude brand in general and really got what we were trying to be with like this masculine kind of like approachable brand. And um, we, so we decided to uh, go with this company and they, you know, we paid them an, a substantial upfront um, fee and we uh, waited for about a month, uh, three weeks to a month to get these iterations. And it was kind of a time sensitive thing too because um, we were actually pitching to raise money um, and we wanted to have these design mock ups done um, for that pitch. But um, so that was like kind of another aspect of that a time sensitive issue. And so we got these iterations back from this this company, and it was just like just a complete kind of disaster, to put it lightly. I mean, it was just it got it, they just like didn't get through all the conversations um, that we had, and like how confident we were that they got it. It just came back um, way off, and every iteration was they pulled out like a box, like a mock-up of the box. And it was like just all over the place. It was multicolored and, um, you know, the dude was not like accentuated and we wanted to, we made it clear that, you know, dude is our brand. We want that kind of like front and center and that didn't happen. And so, um, so what would you do differently knowing what you know now? Yeah. I mean, I think, so it was, it was our first experience dealing with a graphic design company too. So, um, I don't think it was, you know, anyone's fault, but I would do differently. Um, you know, we obviously looked at some of the stuff that they had done in the past and it was really professional and really good stuff, but it was it kind of had all the same feel to it, like the, the design aspects and it really nothing like looked like a dude kind of branded, um, a product or design. And so I think just um, that's one aspect is like kind of doing more due diligence and kind of trying to align, you know, the historical is the best kind of predictor of the future work, right? So we kind of could have used that as a, a, a backlay of yeah. what we would expect. And then also um, just kind of touch and base with the person or the companies as they're working on stuff for you that's something we didn't do we kind of just let them go at it and came back with these kind of final iterations and what we really probably should have been doing in hindsight was touching base with them a couple times a week and saying where you're where are you at now um can i see like where we're going and then kind of like shortening the turn back turnaround loop you know just shortening that feedback loop so you're not like going th through to a final kind of product or something without getting feedback and you know making yeah. small changes where need be. So th those are definitely a couple of takeaways. What's um what's been one of the hardest parts about running the company? Um, well, I mean, a difficult, obviously a difficult thing for us is um, so we've been bootstrapping this whole thing since the beginning, and um, so 
most of us still have full-time jobs and we're kind of um we started the company kind of working at nights and on the weekends just having meetings about how we were going to design and you know having our uh getting things put together to um you know make pitches to people we were selling to and things like that so uh and then you know as we moved forward obviously the sales stuff and um things like that go on. A lot of that goes on during the day where we're all working. Yeah, so how do you manage that? Um, you know, it's tough, man. I mean, I was, uh, I, me personally, I can remember multiple, multiple times, and it's like that for all of the co-founders in our company. We've had to, like, you know, take, I, I mean, we have conversations sometimes, like, about dude products and, like, you could tell sometimes. So a couple of the partners are in sales, so they can kind of you know be driving around and be on calls about dude products and it not matter. But then a couple of us are in office settings um, all the time, and you know you could kind of tell when somebody's like at their desk because they're like, "Hey, what's up? You know, what's going on?" <laughs> be be real quiet. And uh, yeah, so there's been like so many times where you're just having to step away, like go down a floor to like the lunch you know, the cafeteria area and like hold, hold our conversations. And, um, you know, I personally don't have access to like my personal email at, at work. So, you know, I'm on my iPhone for a lot of the day, like next to my work computer, like kind of, uh, answering sales emails or reaching out to people, um, trying to set up banking relationships and, uh, stuff like that. I mean, it's just, it's kind hard of, to do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, well, especially, it, it, you know, you're passionate about your your job that's gotten you to where you, you're at, but obviously, like, as entrepreneurs, you know, you're a lot more passionate about something that you've created. Um, so, yeah, striking that balance is definitely difficult. Yeah. Um, I mean, you talk about the co-founders, too, and I want to ask about that because, you know, it's good to have that support, but also I could see multiple personalities, you know, conflicting. What's um, one of those challenges from having multiple co-founders? Um, so, like I said earlier in the, in the interview, um, we have all been friends for, like, forever. So we definitely have kind of different personalities, but we've all, you know, we, we know what our kind of, like, um, quirks are and um, what our strengths and weaknesses are and stuff. But so, like, for instance, Sean, the CEO, he's a self-proclaimed and actually produces rap so he's he's a white rapper so um striking that balance of uh when to be a ceo of dude products and when to pursue your your rap career you know is uh is always an interesting balance but um no i mean so he he's like a more creative mind you know and um he was actually he's the guy that really wanted to get like dude wipes going and you know he was the baby wipes user and uh he kind of brought this into the fold and we decided to do it and um i'm kind of more conservative minded and um you know like to concentrate on like what's the return on this spend going to be what uh what strategic marketing stuff do we need to execute to like make money you know and i want to see that turnaround like right away um Whereas Sean does a really good job of like having a big picture view, right? So it's just like that balance that's actually it it causes clash for sure sometimes, but it's definitely needed, you know. Because otherwise, if Sh if it was just Sean, you know, Dude Products would theoretically have about fifteen products on you know in in the workings right now and no no money to fund it. But if I were, it would probably it would have. We would never even even gotten off the ground. So um, you strike that balance. You complement each other with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So what? I mean, it seems also that you're in touch with your customers. You're going out to these fairs. You know, you have these tents. And what are some of the features that users talk about or t give you feedback on that you maybe wouldn't have realized otherwise? Um. So yeah, I don't. I guess maybe we didn't necessarily realize it off the bat which was kind of stupid i guess but um like if you just like look at the package right like a lot of people um and i said before like a lot of comments we get is like is that a sex wipe and a lot of people have commented like this looks like a condom you know 
Um, so that's actually kind of something that we're, we're working on, um, is to try and like redesign things, maybe even just shift like dude wipes, whether like instead of it being horizontal, maybe it being vertically aligned, maybe that makes it look less, less like a condom package or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, we haven't gone through, this is our first iteration of the product, you know? And so that's like actually really interesting feedback when like customers say that looks like a condom and like I may not buy it just because of that. Or some others say it looks like a condom and I kind of like that it looks like a condom, you know. Um, but I think we can strike a balance of maybe changing some color, like maybe not making it black and making it, you know, kind of like a gray color or something or a metallic color. Um, so, yeah, I mean, customer feedback is, is huge at, at all times, you know, I mean, they're the people that are ultimately going to be, ultimately going to determine the success of your company. So, um, you know, any takeaways that we can glean from our customers, we are more than open to it. And like with our, it's embedded in our packaging, customer feedback is too, because we uh, like on the back of like each wipe, there's like a customer tweet that could potentially land on it, right? So we want to be engaged with our customers at all times. Um, and the more feedback that we can get from them, I think the better company will probably be. Yeah, another question that I was thinking as you were talking is, you know, you know, it's tough to manage all this, like a growing company, full-time job. How do you know when to just transition fully to the company, to dude? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and, and that's a really good question. And it, I guarantee you it differs company by company. Um, so for us, we have been part-time dude products, you know, for the past couple of years. And, you know, the first year of that two years was just trying to find a manufacturer and coming up with the designs and stuff like that. Um, so, but as far as knowing when to quit, it's like, so we've been growing pretty significantly on in our online accounts recently. And, you know, we got accepted to this accelerator program. So we have like a significant amount of momentum. And I think it's like a feeling that you can get as like an entrepreneur, like, if you have like significant momentum and you know customers are buying and um you know accelerators are huge because you just built a network of people that have had success in pretty much the industry that you're going into um that you could just have at your disposal um so i, I think there's a momentum kind of like just feel that you'll get uh, that you'll feel comfortable um, leaving. But then, you know, the other aspect is you got to live too. Um, so, you know, us being, we have four co-founders total. So, you know, we're trying to raise, we're actually in the process of raising money right now. Um, so, you know, we got to be practical. Like Sean has left his job and he's full-time dude products. Um, I am still working and my two other partners are still working. Um, and once we raise this capital, um, I'm going to transition off and be full time as well. Um, but you know, it, it's just, like I said, it's just kind of a momentum feel. And then you got to have can if you have co-founders, you got to have candid conversations and good communication and a plan to really, um, so everybody feels comfortable and it's not going to cause friction. Yeah. yeah. Um, because you know, find as much as you don't want to talk about like money and like person personally being comfortable, like you want to pour everything into the business at the same time, you got to live, you want to live and not, you know, be scraping by too. So yeah, how do you, how do you, you know, breach that topic? Especially like people, you know, I can see on one hand you're comfortable with your you, people you've known forever, but on the same, in the same respect, once money comes up, like tension, you know, people kind of feel tension with it. Right. Um, you know, We've had, throughout the past couple of years, we've had, uh, you know, those kind of, I wouldn't even call, at least for our company, it really wasn't, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of, like, tension within the talks, you know. We're all pretty, uh, I mean, 
we're immature in our own ways too, but we're all pretty like mature guys. And we've, like I said, we've known each other for so long that we wanted to make sure ownership and like money issues came up at the beginning. And as we go, as we hit like certain milestones about, okay, we're going to need to raise, like, let's have this conversation. Um, we've really done a good job about that. So like, you know, we've kind of divvied up things as far as how long certain people have been involved and like, um, the amount of work that kind of we have put in to a certain point. Right. And that's kind of how we divvied up retrospectively and going forward. It's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, now the only thing that we're, um, kind of having discussions about is, yeah, just the roll in of full-time working. Um, and those aren't really tough conversations because we feel like we're at a pretty good point right now. And once we raise this money, we're going to actually be able to execute on like a lot of the plans that we have and stuff. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I have one last question for you, Brian. But before I ask it, I just want you to tell us a little bit more about what's exciting right now with Dude Wipes. Yeah, so uh, what's really exciting for us right now is, um, like I said, we just got done with um, Incubation Station, uh, which is a consumer products accelerator in uh, Austin, Texas. So we were down in Austin, Texas for three months and, um, you know, getting mentored by awesome people, super smart people, very experienced consumer products people. So we got through that program and we our business is just so much more refined now. And... Um, Right now, we are trying. We're basically sourcing money, so we're trying to raise Series uh, Series AA capital, and um, that's really exciting because we've we've had really good discussions over the past. Like since we've we've gotten done with the program, we've had really good discuss, discussions with people. Um, people are just kind of sourcing through the details of the deal, and we're going through some negotiations. Um, but uh, yeah, man, we we feel like we're in a good spot. We're probably gonna raise this money within the next couple months, hopefully, and uh, be able to start executing. And um, we're really excited to. We're working with a company, kind of like dual tracking. We're working with a company to actually that really does understand. And we did our due diligence. We're checking up, like you know, lessons learned type thing. But we're doing like a redesign of uh, the packaging and the brand and the website um, and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, once we once we raise this capital, we're going to be ready to roll and um, start executing on our marketing plans. And the goal for us is to uh, get on retail shelves of Walgreens and um, CVS and stores like that. And uh, we feel like it's it's not too far from happening. So so everyone listening, um, what's the website they can go to to check out um, your company? Uh, it's uh, www.dudeproducts.com. Got it. Okay. So the last question I had, Brian, was um, I know that early on you guys uh, tried out for Shark Tank. Yeah. What happened with that? <laughs> um, it was it was actually a cool experience. I actually wasn't uh, present at the trial, but um, I wish I, we might have like pictures or a video that we should like throw up on the website or something like that because uh, I'll have to find this. Yeah. So um, this was like a year and a half ago. So it was like the casting like last year, two years ago maybe. And um, so we didn't have product yet. We literally had like a pretty bad looking like mock-up of like a box of dude wipes, you know. So we were going into these tryouts in Chicago with like that as like our product offering. And um, the way we kind of, so like our brand, we want to be entertaining, engaging, right? So we went in there and one of my buddies, um, dressed up as Mr. Wonderful to uh, make the pitch. <laughs> and so Sean, the CEO of our company, or CED, I should say, chief executive dude, um, he was pitching to, it was kind of like a skit that they drew up, right? So um, he was pitching to Mr. Wonderful and stuff like that. And uh, we made it through the um, final casting call. So we like, got videotaped and stuff like that. And uh, we got sent to the executive producers and uh, we just never heard anything back. But um, I think it might be a different story if we were to do it again and, like, actually have a sales track record and, like, an actual product to present them. So Did you have an actual, like, were you thinking ahead, like, who would you want to invest? Or did not even get that far? No, I mean, we definitely had those conversations. I mean, I think 
what would align awesome with us would be uh, Cuban, just because we've we've actually reached out to um, professional sports teams and have had conversations with professional sports teams and gotten in their locker rooms and stuff like that with dude wipes. Um, so we think that could have been like an awesome partnership mm -hmm. because he could have gotten us in any NBA locker room and probably beyond just to build that like brand authentication basically, you know? Right. Um, so yeah, we, we thought about it, but yeah, awesome. it, uh, it didn't happen. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Bren, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure and I look forward to people checking out uh, dudeproducts.com. Yeah, man. Thanks. I appreciate, appreciate your time a lot, and um, it's great being with everybody in the audience. Thanks, Brian. All right.